Alright, hello everyone and welcome back to our speedrun breakdown series. Going in chronological order once again, we have Last Wish, we have Garden of Salvation, and today we're going to be talking about Deep Stone Crypt, the Beyond Light Raid. And um, yeah, without further ado, let's get started. So, first of all, let's start at the very beginning of the raid. Entrance is very similar to Garden of Salvation. It's literally- oh, hold on, let me just get these quality settings down. Okay. And it's literally just, you know, there's a couple ads at the start that need to be nuked, and- oh, there's a little bit of a skip there, but basically all of them just died to Galahorn. And then we have three people that make it through this little hatch, and they uh, travel through these caves, and they start doing entrance through desolation. So, notice I said three people. So why are there only three people doing entrance, and what are the rest of the fire team members doing? Well, if we wait just a second, oh, wait, they're leaving. Why are they leaving? Well, they're leaving because, first of all, fitting six people through this entrance is A, inconsistent, and B, a little bit unwieldy, right? But most importantly, C, you only need three or four, depending on your strategy, people to start crypt security without causing any time loss. Which means that, you know, you just send the minimum number of people through, and everyone else can just rejoin at a certain time, and they will spawn in crypt security and still be able to help with the encounter to a fair degree. So let's go ahead and see what these guys are doing for entrance. Now, if you've done Deepstone before, you know that this section is pretty long. It can be pretty grueling for LFG groups, you know, people getting lost in the blizzard. So what do these guys do? Well, they're speedrunners, so they just skip past almost every single bubble. So if we watch Gunnerhawk right here, he's doing a sparrow attack called slipstreaming. This allows you to rotate your sparrow and make clever use of certain dodge timings to send yourself further and further and further. And he's basically going to make it all the way to the sixth bubble. Oh, just barely making it with nine frostbite stacks. And then he's going to make it straight to that final seventh bubble. And so real quick here, something I do in these series is I talk about how there's new alternatives or current strats because this raid was run by this team five months ago. And in today's meta for this raid, when it comes to speedrunning, you see he's going to turn off his frame cap. It's a little bit easier to slipstream long distances when you have your frame set to 30 or 60 FPS. Um, but one of the newer strategies that people are using in this raid is something called slip skating. So what is slip skating? Slip skating is basically using a shatter skate off the back of your sparrow, because they do it on Hunter, you don't have your well at the start of the raid. A shatter skate off the back of a sparrow that is currently spinning very fast and at the end of a slipstream rotation cycle. So it's basically a faster way to do what you just watched, which is just regular slipstreaming, and that allows them to get faster to the end of entrance into this little airlock. So now, you can see Gunnerhawk also has a specific exotic on his back. And that's Vesper of Radius. And you see he also just Phoenix dived next to the door after shooting the ground. And the reason for this is Gunnerhawk never gets a flag in first encounter. Okay? In fact, I'm pretty sure almost no one gets a flag in first encounter. If not, yeah, I'm pretty sure no one gets a flag in first encounter. So, uh, what does Gunnerhawk do? So, he is going to be using Vesper of Radius, uh, triple distribution, triple dynamo, and Phoenix Dive in order to get his well back as quickly as possible, or not back, but rather just get a well, as quickly as possible so that he can use it for his transition for movement tech from the first encounter to the second encounter to make up for the fact that he doesn't have a flag. So let's move on here. These guys are going to finish this section that we call Caves. They're going to make it all the way to first encounter, and we'll talk briefly about how first encounter is started a little bit uniquely compared to what you would see in like an LFG run. So what's going on right here with Gunnerhawk? He is going to be getting off his sparrow and his teammates are two hunters and they're doing like a little bit of a shatter skate line entrance to make it to crypt security as quickly as possible but gunnerhawk is kind of taking this long scenic route and the reason for that is because there is a checkpoint right about where he is right now called pipes and if he doesn't get this checkpoint then crypt security that door won't open and the objective won't update you can't start the encounter so gunnerhawk is here to hit pipes for his teammates and then he's going to do something a little bit special so besides this, you know, a little bit of slipstreaming here to make this section a little bit faster, he's going to get off here, get on his sparrow again. And now we're going to see him do something called a sparrow breach. So sparrows were not present in Garden and, uh, you know, Last Wish because you can't summon your sparrows there, but they are present in Deepstone Crypt. Not only can you slipstream on entrance, but you also can use a sparrow breach in multiple walls in this raid to get out of bounds. And you'll see Gunnerhawk does that right now. He is on his way to first encounter. And he is going to be floating outside of the map while first encounter is started. And so right here, real quick, I want to talk about another optimization that's been made in this raid since the five months prior that this raid came out. And basically, there is an area in the blizzard entrance section of Deepstone Crypt 
where you can go out of bounds right away instead of making it to the final airlock, which allows you to go straight all out of bounds to the first encounter where Gunnerhawk is right now. And the way that the current strat is set up is that they actually have three people do this out of bounds entrance and everybody starts the encounter out of bounds because you can actually pick up operator from out of bounds from the terminal through the floor as well. So that's another cool little, you know, optimization. It allows you to start the encounter even faster because normally you in the, in this encounter, you have to wait for the door to open to security. You have to head over to that terminal and then you have to pick up operator. This way, everybody can start out of bounds. One person breaches inbounds to be in the basement so that they can be operator and everybody else kind of does what they're doing right now. So speaking of being out of bounds, well, um, besides just starting the encounter faster, which obviously there's some benefits to that in a speedrun. But besides that, why would you want to start with one person, which is what Gunnerhawk is doing out of bounds? Well, Gunnerhawk is going to do something called oob scanning. So let's go ahead. He's going to be he's going to be picking up scanner zero, who's just died right about now. Uh, he's the one who's picked up operator. He's going to kill scanner and then he's going to die. And that operator buff on the ground is going to be picked up through the floor, as you can see by Mad, who's currently jumping into the ceiling of the basement. He's going to pick up operator from zero's dead body through the floor. And Zero's also going to kill that scanner vandal so that Gunnerhawk can pick up scanner through the floor. Now, this encounter in particular, we've talked about RNG when it comes to Last Wish, we've talked about RNG when it comes to Garden of Salvation. This encounter is the biggest RNG encounter in all of Deepstone Crypt, and the reason for that is because, first of all, sometimes the Scanner Vandal spawns in a location that's very unfavorable for the Oob Scanner to pick it up through the floor, that's number one. And number two, um, if you get fuse buttons, not fuse buttons, if you get buttons, operator buttons in the basement that are unfavorable, it's automatically going to be a lot of time loss. For example, if you get one, two, one, two, the person whose operator has to basically, you know, sword all the way back to one, which is very far away from where they start getting operator. And so it's a lot of time loss. Ideally, you want something like four, five, four, five, or at least have buttons between three and five for both sides. So unfortunately, that RNG can be very, very annoying to run with as well. But we're going to see that they get some decent calls here. I get the, you know, I think they get something like, you know, three, five. Yeah, you get three, five. So Gunnerhawk is able to see some of these buttons from out of bounds. He can turn his camera in certain directions to call out these buttons to Mad, who is currently in the basement with Operator. And we can see here, Gunnerhawk is just barely able to see that that three call is there. Looking down, you can see that he it's not four, it's not five, and now he's looking for two and one. I believe it's one, if I'm not mistaken, using process of elimination. And now, Matt has shot all of those buttons very, very quick, as you can see, and damage has already started. Now, you might be wondering, well, if Zero just died, right, and Gunnerhawk is out of bounds, and Matt is in the basement, who is shooting the fuses? Well, that's a good question, and in order to answer that question, we are going to need to go back a little bit in time. And the reason for that is, you may notice that people are joining the fire team right around here. And the reason why people are joining the fire team right around here is because they're doing something called a death warp. Now, you're probably familiar with a death warp from Last Wish, or not Last Wish, from Garden of Salvation, right? We talked about how a death warp is basically if you are dead in the same load zone as an encounter, and then someone starts the encounter, your ghost will get transported straight to that encounter's starting location. So this load zone is called Restricted, and when Gunnerhawk and his friends make it to this load zone, if everybody joins the fire team, they will spawn in Restricted. And so when they spawn in, if they die, and then Zero starts the encounter by picking up Operator, all of their orbs, all of their ghosts will get teleported to that little ledge above the flag in Crypt Security. So you're going to see that right about now. If we just skip forward here, and you see Zero starts the encounter. Vortex and Kenny are already in the raid encounter, ready to do damage, and that's because they were able to spawn right there because of that death warp that we just talked about. So let's move on with this encounter, and let's go ahead and keep going. So right here, the other benefit to oob scanning is that you never need to transfer scanner between two players. The scanner can call out the buttons downstairs, and then they can immediately stick their head into this little block here, and they can call the buttons that need to be shot that are, that are the fuses, not the buttons, the fuses. Sorry, I got those mixed up. Okay, so now Gunnerhawk, he's basically just calling out these, uh, you know, these fuses. And the other thing that you notice he's doing is he's currently surrounded by enemies. And the reason why this is so great is because Vesper of Radius gives you increased uh, class ability regeneration when you're surrounded by enemies. So he can basically just farm up his well while he's calling these fuses. And that's exactly what he's doing right here. You see his Phoenix Dive is coming back very, very quickly. Boom, he almost has his well. One more Phoenix Dive while he's calling these last few fuses. Boom, he gets his he gets his well just in the nick of time, and boom. 
now he's going to be doing this transition. So let's briefly talk about um, two more things before we move to Atrax. Okay, so first Gunnerhawk and Zero, they're doing something called the early Atrax transition, which is sort of a new kind of phenomenon, a new strategy that was added to Deepstone Crypt over the past year. And it's similar to what people do in Ribbon. So if you remember when we did the last Switch speedrun breakdown, there are two players that leave the vault encounter early and they basically sword skate through the joining allies at a specific time and their joining gets cancelled by the end of the encounter being ended behind them. So when vault ends, they're already basically at Ribbon. That is exactly what Gunnerhawk and Zero are doing here. Even though the encounter is trying to pull them back, they know the encounter will end within the next 5 seconds, so they're already transitioning to Atrax. So let's see here. He hits that load zone at just the right area so that it spawns him inbounds in the Atrax load zone. And then he does one more well line right over here. And boom. So he's, his joining allies is gone. The previous encounter has ended. And that's allowed him to basically be at Atrax instantly. And all of his teammates can just leave and rejoin. Okay, so that's Deepstone Crypt. Uh, that's Crypt Security. The final thing that I'm going to talk about is you're probably wondering, if they only have three people doing damage, how did they break all the fuses so fast? Well, the answer is right here. You can see Chris. He is currently using the Wardcliffe coil. If the Wardcliffe oil coil oil, if the Wardcliffe coil is aimed very carefully, it's actually capable of one-shotting a fuse. So Chris is on Reign of Fire and a Wardcliffe coil, if I'm not mistaken. He's soloing the dark side. And there's two people on the light side right now that are duoing the fuses with the fourth horseman because one mag from both of them will one-shot a fuse very, very quickly. So this is kind of like the most optimal optimized way that people do damage to fuses in crypt security in today's you know deep stone speed running meta so let's kind of move on and let's go ahead and take a look at what happens right here so there is a timer pause here because technically if everybody has good hardware and gets good loads uh, it is possible to have everybody rejoin the fire team in time here for uh there not to be any pause at all however destiny 2 is like connection based game and sometimes people will have bad loads and someone might be on console etc etc so to make things fair there's a bit of a timer pause here there was one earlier in the run as well but we're not really going to talk about that one because it's a little bit more insignificant so this one you see gunnerhawk is pausing here he's waiting for his team to join and when they join you're going to see that he and Zero are going to make it out of this Atrax room as the door is closing as the cutscene starts. So we're going to skip forward a little bit here and we're going to talk about a Gunnerhawk's skip. So boom, he's leaving the room right now. He is going to well bounce his way up to a certain area and we're going to talk about one more cool speedrun tech and that is called canceling joining. Canceling joining. So what is Gunnerhawk doing right now? He appears, to be going, he appears to be going backward through the raid. And what he's doing right now, he's, he's going backward to the Crypt Security load zone. So this is a little bit complicated to explain, but I'll do my best to break it down for a more casual perspective. So in Destiny 2, load zones, they don't kind of just start and end like this, right? There's no just strict defined boundary between the two. Load zones have what is called a hub between them. So there's an area that two load zones can share, right? And so let's call this load zone A. And let's say it's Crypt Security. Now let's call this load zone B and let's call it, you know, the Atrax load. If you were to go this way through the raid, right? If you were to go this way through the raid, um, this load zone would act like it extends this far, okay? However, if you were to enter the Atrax load zone by passing this line, if you were to try to go backward, then this is how this load zone would behave. Does that make sense? So whatever direction you enter from, the load zone will be larger from that direction. So. What Gunnerhawk is essentially doing is he was in this load zone right here. He is going backward just far enough so that he can hit this part of the restricted load zone. And then he's going to go back and he's going to sit right here at the border. Okay. And the reason for that is this. I will explain what's about to happen on screen and then I'm going to go ahead and play it. Okay. So every encounter in Destiny 2 has something called, you know, joining allies. And I'm sure you're aware of this. And the, the purpose of joining allies is so that if people are somehow able to get to an encounter by themselves, uh, they can, you know, bring everybody else in their fire team if someone's dead or someone's lost or whatever, you can bring them to the next encounter, right? And so joining allies, though, is not always permanent. Some encounters, they only have it for 10 seconds or 8 seconds or 7 seconds or however many seconds, right? And so you can actually reset your joining allies timer from, you know, 0 seconds, 1 seconds, whatever, back up to 5 seconds by re-entering the load zone that an encounter is pulling you is pulling you to okay so in this case when atrax is started everybody that is not in the atrax load zone gets joining allies everybody that's not in the play area of atrax gets joining allies and so if gunnerhawk wants to cancel this 
he is going to sit right here like i said he's going to sit right here in the restricted load zone and when his timer gets kind of low he's going to dip into the into the the clarity control load zone i should say which is the a track load zone, the b load zone that's going to jump his joining allies timer back up to five and then he's going to go back and start doing his skip and the reason for that is because the a track joining allies is something like eight or nine seconds right and so if gunner hawk resets his joining allies timer at just the right moment the joining allies will just disappear it will stop right so not all encounters in the game are like this some encounters have permanent infinite joining and even if you skip really really late the joining allies will still be there. But thankfully, Atrax is not one of those encounters. The joining allies goes away after eight or nine seconds, which is what allows Gunnerhawk to execute this skip. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and see how Gunnerhawk handles this. So we're gonna go forward a little bit. And right here, Gunnerhawk is in restricted. You can see that he's sitting right at the border of the load zone between restricted and clarity control. And you'll see when his joining allies timer starts, he waits a little bit and he goes backward. And you see joining allies disappears and you'll see the health bar because Atrax has been started, he's now in the Atrax load zone, and boom, it goes right back up to 5. So Gunnerhawk has kind of mastered this timing, he knows exactly when he needs to cancel his joining allies, and that will allow it to fade right at 0, it cancels right there, and boom. Now, Gunnerhawk is doing another cool tech here as part of his skip, and it's called, uh, well it doesn't have an official name, but I'm going to call it Default Spawn Exploitation. And the way spawn, spawn zones work is, I'm sure you know this, you've seen this when we talked about Garden, uh, I think it might have been in Wish as well. No, I think it's, yeah, I think it's just about Garden. Uh, in Wish, we had default spawn manipulation, which is kind of a different thing. But default spawn exploitation, which is what I'll call it, is basically when you hit a load zone and your feet don't touch the ground, right? If you don't touch the ground at all and you don't set your spawn and you die, the, the, the load zone will automatically spawn you at a certain area, which is called the default spawn of that load zone, right? So what Gunnerhawk is doing is, if you remember from earlier, when we were going through the cave section right over here, right? You see how that load zone is called restricted? Well, this load zone is also restricted. This is the same load zone. It's very, very large. It's a very, very large load zone. And the default spawn is actually back here, a little bit behind where he is right now. So if we go ahead and take a look at Gunnerhawk, what, he's gonna, what is he going to do? Well, he is going to die right in restricted load zone without letting his feet touch the ground so he doesn't set a spawn. And you'll notice when he respawns in about five seconds and now, right? Look at that. He is at the default spawn of the restricted load zone. So that is part of how this skip works. And now Gunnerhawk is essentially going to do part two of what he did at the start of the raid, except now he's going to have a well. So we're going to skip all the way here. He's going to do that exact same Sparrow Breach one more time, except for the only thing he's going to do this time. And the whole reason he does this is because it's difficult to get out of bounds from Atrax uh, in this way, unless you have a Sparrow like preset up. So he's basically just doing half the skip in reverse and then going back out of bounds again from you know the the tried and true method so now he's you know he's in he's in the atrax load again he's going up and we take a look over here he's kind of completing a skip his teammates have just done atrax damage besides the final stand health bar and he is doing the skip right now now you might be wondering why doesn't he just go straight to third encounter because you know um if you're familiar with deep stone out of bounds you probably know how this goes but this is not where third encounter is right in fact if you notice if you're paying close attention this is actually the area at the end of spacewalk right so this is the area where you fight all the brigs and, you know, the dark council guards and all that stuff. And then there's a door that opens when you finish. Well, there is actually a checkpoint in this doorway here where if you don't hit it, the game doesn't think you finished the jumping puzzle. So this is a retroactive checkpoint, which means that Gunnerhawk can hit it now during his skip. And then later on, when he wants to pull everyone to third encounter, the game will update and be like, oh, someone was in that area at that time. So someone must have completed the jumping puzzle. So it allows you to pull people to third encounter. So he's going to go ahead and hit this checkpoint, which is colloquially called Briggs. And he's going to go ahead and well line. He is going to complete his skip. He's going to slide into this load zone. And the reason why he does this so quickly, this part, I mean, of course, it's a speed run, so he's doing everything quickly. But this door, it's an asset load, and it, it takes time to load in. And so Gunnerhawk, what he's doing is he's making sure he gets to this door as quickly as possible so that the asset doesn't load in and block him from entering the door. You'll see that it spawns in just kind of right behind him. Those doors kind of just materialize um, because he's just entered the load zone, right? So now he's going to rally, and um, we'll talk about this when we get to third encounter, because I've skipped very far forward into the raid. I don't want to kind of whiplash you guys too hard. We're going to take it back. We're going to throw it back the second encounter, and this time we're going to watch the other person's POV that was with Gunnerhawk in that room at the start of Atrax, and that's going to be, of course, my friend Zero Worldline. So, Mr. Zero Worldline, what is he doing, right? What is he doing over here? Well, while his fire team members are joining, it's just him and Gunnerhawk in the fire team right now. His four friends are currently joining. He is doing probably a route you've never seen before. He's doing like a bit of a special route. And what he's doing right now is he's going out of bounds to go past the door of Atrax. 
So he's shadow diving down right here. And he is actually going to try to squeeze his way through a terminal right here. And this is going to allow him to do something called early starting. So what is early starting? Well, it, the name kind of gives away, doesn't it? You know, he is just simply early starting the encounter so that as soon as all of his fire team members are loaded in, they can instantly rally and then they can call start. And so nobody has to do this long trek where they walk around and they start the encounter really slow. He can start it for them. And that way the ads start spawning quicker. And as we know, from Garden of Salvation first encounter, if you spawn in the ads faster, you get the mechanics of the done mechanics of the you get the mechanics of the encounter done faster, and you get to damage faster. So, if there's anything we've learned, that's how it goes. The objective updates, they rally, and boom. Zero, of course, starts the encounter. So now Zero's job is very simple. He's just gonna clear some ads. He's gonna help out the other person on bottom ads, on the bottom floor ads here. Gunnerhawk, of course, he is doing his skip. He's just died to that restricted load. And um, he's going to kill one servitor. He's probably going to call out where Operator is for his friend if Operator comes out on this side. And then he's going to leave on a little skip, which is called Airlock. And we're going to go over that in a second. So boom, there we go. Operator is right. He lets his friend Chris know that Operator is in fact on right. And he heads up the pods and he's going up. So we're going to skip this part where he goes up the pods. I'm sure you guys have seen that before. And you see his teammates are getting set up for damage. Extinction protocol is just activated, but Zero is not going to participate. What is he doing instead? Well, he is sliding out here, making it through this gap. And what's he up to? Oh, okay. He's shatterlining. Let's get forward a little bit. Where's he going? He is... Oh, he is on his way up a wall. And he's, he appears to be now entering a different load zone from his teammates called Morning Star. This is the jumping puzzle, the spacewalk load zone. So what is Zero Worldline doing out here? Well, he is actually hitting a checkpoint called Airlock. So this is in fact an airlock. And uh, apparently, for whatever reason, um, you cannot pull people to the, thir the third encounter of this raid unless someone is sitting here. This is called the airlock checkpoint. So Zero is currently hitting the airlock checkpoint so that when second encounter ends, Gunnerhawk can then pull to third encounter uh, right at that moment. So just to recap here, Atrax is here, right? And then you have Airlock, AL, you have Briggs, which was hit by Gunnerhawk, and then you have Descent, which is third encounter. So Gunnerhawk, he hit that, and then he went to third encounter. Zero helped with that, and then he went to this checkpoint. And now everybody else can get pulled from Atrax straight to Descent. So that's how the checkpoints work in this raid. Okay, so that's Airlock. Now let's talk about the actual Atrax encounter, okay? So we've talked about the 2-3 skip, which is what Gunnerhawk was doing. We've talked about 0DL and his airlock. We've talked about early starting. Uh, we've talked about people loading in and rallying and just calling start right away. What? How, do, how does damage work? How does damage work? Let's talk about that, okay? So first off, I'm going to start with Vortex VR. He is going to be sitting here at the top of this clone area, right? And at this point, him and his teammates, they have used rockets to clear basically all of the ads. They've, they've cleared all of the ads, they've nuked the servitors, someone has scanner, and they're just going to call out where it is. So the call was just made, it's right, boom, everybody kind of T-crashes slash Nova bombs uh, the clone. I believe this season everybody is on T-crash, this was a season that had Thunderous Retort, which basically allowed all your T-crashes to do more damage. So you only needed t two T-crashes, you could have a Nova instead, but now, you know, they have a Warlock as well. So boom, they go ahead and do that. I believe, uh, yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty much main damage. There's some fourth horsemen involved as well from one or two people, but uh, that's pretty much it. Pretty pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And um, if you're curious how final stand is done, well, final stand is just as easy. We have Chris, and if you remember Chris, he was on the bottom floor doing damage, and the section the section the <laughs> the second extinction activates. He pops his super with scanner, and of course. T crash one shots Atrax final stand clones. So there you go. Chris just collapsed that Atrax clone, sent it straight packing, and the encounter is now over. And you'll see that since all the checkpoints are hit on time, Gunnerhawk is able to pull everyone to third encounter. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about third encounter. So third encounter starts with our friend Gunnerhawk. He is rallied on Anarchy, and the reason for that is because he is single-handedly responsible for all of the ads that spawn at the start of the encounter. And yes, this this encounter is the most ad clear sensitive of any encounter in this raid. Atrax, you gotta kill the ads, you gotta kill the servitors, yada 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 to get the damage, right? Descent, almost every single time you hear that alarm go off like, and then the core starts spawning, 
that is almost entirely determined by how quickly you can kill ads. And so all five doors that spawn in ads relentlessly during this encounter need to be trapped. And Anarchy is a very good way of handling it as long as you have heavy ammo. So you're going to notice a recurring theme in this encounter is everybody's making Aeon finishers, they're marking captains with Cenotaph, and thankfully the mini bosses, so the Overload Champion and the, uh, the, you know, the captains that come out, they don't count towards the ad count that spawns in the next set of cores. So you can kind of take your time and make a bunch of finishers and everyone will be stocked up on anarchy ammo. So that's what Gunnerhawk is going to be doing right now. He's alone though. So he needs to make sure all these anarchy traps are nice and spread out in a perfect way. He's just waiting for these ads to spawn in. His four anarchies are currently ticking and he is just throwing nades left, right, and center, trying to make sure every single door is trapped because this early section is very important. And you see those augments have already started spawning in ASAP. Gunnerhawk hears from his teammates where Suppressor is. He is the designated Suppressor on his team. And Suppressor is, in terms of time, uh, one of the two most important things, or three most important things I should say in this encounter. One of those things is ad clear. We already talked about ad clear. That shit gotta be fast. Okay, that's number one. Number two is, obviously, you can't dunk your cores if you know, if the banks are offline and your suppressor is not done. So your suppressor has to be very fast because if you get good cores like inner left and inner right, well, those can practically be dunked right away. So your suppressor is going to be what you're waiting for sometimes if they're slow. So he's got to be fast. And number three is, of course, um, dealing with cores, right? Dealing with cores, uh, shooting the right button and uh, sorting cores off of far right, which we'll talk about in a second. So Gunnerhawk, we're going to watch his POV because it's quite important. Basically, what he's going to do, he's going to apply a damage over time effect to the boss or use a trace rifle in order to make sure that the boss is suppressed very quickly. Another thing that Gunnerhawk is going to do is he is going to die with suppressor so that he is guaranteed to have Suppressor for the next round and that he doesn't get activated, or he doesn't get deactivated rather. So now he's using Wither Horde. He also has Necrotic Grips on, and you'll see that in just a second. He is going to also use a melee on the boss, which is going to tick the boss over time. And you know, that tick, tick, ticking, that's going to allow Gunnerhawk to basically have like Wither Horde on the boss. And as he's traveling through the three drones, he doesn't need to shoot the boss and it will tick him and he'll, he'll get the suppress off because any damage instance works. Now, another thing you're going to notice Gunnerhawk doing is that instead of dying so that he's burning his team's reses, um, he is banking suppressor in the terminal. And the reason for that is because if you bank your uh, augment in the terminal before the deactivation happens, then it's guaranteed that somebody else gets deactivated. So Gunnerhawk is basically ensuring that he always gets suppressor and that nobody else gets suppressor because everybody else in this encounter is on anarchy. So besides one other person, which we'll talk about in a second. So everybody else is on anarchy. And so if they were to get suppressor, it would be bad. So Gunnerhawk, 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 Gunnerhawk cannot be deactivated. He is waiting for his teammates to call that they are getting deactivated. And now Gunnerhawk is getting ready to suppress the boss. He is helping stun that champion. Boom. He is going to Wither Horde. And he's going to just do these nice skates again. So Gunnerhawk's job is basically just doing this for the entire encounter, right? The rest of the team, uh, you have operators that are juggling augments. You have scanners that are juggling augments. And the operator is prioritizing shooting outer left core because that one is by far the furthest from the deposits. And if you are ever unfortunate enough to get an outer right spawn, then there is someone who is designated sitting by the outer right core who can essentially eager edge sword the core off of another person. So if you didn't know this, you can basically interact with someone else and try to take their core off of them. And if you eager edge swipe at the last second, it kind of lunges you forward while you pick up the core. So someone else is also aiming to do that on outer right so that they can bring that core close to the center if it is an outer right spawn. Okay, so that is some of the ways that core manipulation is done in this encounter to guarantee that you get some nice close distance spawns. So like I said earlier, right, of course Gunnerhawk is kind of doing his thing again, right, waiting for his teammates to call deactivations. At the end of this encounter, so we're going to skip past here a little bit, this is kind of the final two dunks, you see that red flaming descent in the window here. But one of these things that you're going to see that I mentioned earlier is there's a lot of finishers that are being made this encounter, right? And Gunnerhawk's not picking up most of them because he doesn't really need them, but his teammates really do because they're on Anarchy, right? And so, you know, Anarchy trapping is super, super important in this encounter, making sure all those doors are trapped. There you go. He's, he's doing that melee. It's ticking the boss. You can see it going immune, immune, immune. There we go. And you'll see at the end of this encounter, look at all of that heavy, right? Look at all of that heavy. Absolutely insane amount of finishers being made by this team. That is kind of how it goes. He's got, I believe, a lead from gold trace and a lead from gold supremacy on uh, so that he can pick up heavy ammo and get special. He is fully, fully stocked up right now because he's not going to be getting a rally on his way into fourth encounter. So that is pretty much it for descent, right? 
you've got the finishers, you've got the good ad clear, you've got the forcing certain people to be suppressor, you've got the, you know, sorting the outer right core, the fast suppress that Gunnerhawk is doing, and now for the final strat between Descent and Tanix is going to be one last thing, and that's going to be on the transition. It's going to be respawning or resing your teammates at a certain moment as the crash happens, and that's going to allow them to avoid being what we called grannied or grandmothered or basically very slowed by the crash, having your ankles broken by the crash. So normally, I'm sure you're aware that during Deep Stone, at the end of Descent, when this crash happens, you become very, very slow. You get like shell shock, right? But Gunnerhawk has been revived by Kenny at just the perfect moment so that this slow effect does not apply to him. And now he's able to just freely skate his way all the way to fourth encounter. And so his three teammates are actually not getting a rally. You have three people on swords here. They're getting to the encounter as quickly as they can. And as soon as they get there, they're not even going to rally, right? They're not even going to rally. They're just going to start the encounter instantly. And that way you get these ads cleared up as quickly as possible. He's even going to use his super to get this aggers will give inform effect. So he can clear these ads a lot faster. The TTK goes down. Right now he's looking for the captain. The captain has to die as quickly as possible. So that Tanix starts to move to a certain side and the augments spawn. So Gunnerhawk is of course going to be Suppressor again. This is the exact same thing he was doing before, except uh, in this encounter, the ad clear also matters, right? You have to clear the ads to spawn the captain. You got to kill the captain to spawn the uh, captain, sorry, to get Tanix to move and spawn the Vandals. But on top of that, the ad clear also matters for one more reason. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But just take note of the fact that Gunnerhawk is trapping doors where ads will come to spawn later on, okay? So right now, know that Gunnerhawk is currently suppressing. All four of the people that are not doing Operator or Suppressor, they all Izzy their own core, so that those all break instantly. He's going to go ahead and trap Tanix with Anarchy, and he's just going to make it real quick, making sure it's a nice one detain by just running through these drones as quickly as possible. Boom, all done. And now he's going to make sure all of these adds die ASAP, right? So he's just nuking this captain. And the reason for that is this. Bet you haven't seen that before, right? So normally in LFG Tanix, nobody clears the ads, right? Because why would you, right? You're just sitting there. Usually people are waiting somewhere over here and you're kind of just sitting there and you're waiting for damage to start, right? So you're kind of just sitting there and you know, 10 seconds, 11 seconds, Tanix just sits there, he's shooting you, damage hasn't started. If you clear all of the ads after banking chorus quickly enough, Tanix will not only start damage instantly, so he'll teleport to middle and start damage instantly, but he also won't boop you away from him. So notice how all of his teammates are just sitting there. None of them got sent flying backward. They're all just sitting there. And because that is because their ad clear was good enough so that Tanix never booped them and he just started damage instantly. And we'll go ahead and take a look at this bake. Of course, Gunnerhawk has barely no ammo because, you know, he didn't get the flag. He was on Anarchy, blah, 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 blah. So he's just going to do double pellet swaps. Nothing too crazy. His teammates are spamming rockets as well as pellet shotguns. You have a couple of thunder crashes for final stand and boom, the boss is dead. So that is essentially it for Tanix. Um, I'm just going over my notes here. Yeah, there's pretty much not much else for Tanix. Uh, this raid, to be honest with you, hasn't changed that much since this raid was last run by this team. Um, their third encounter was very good. Their fourth encounter was decent. Um, and their first encounter, you know, besides the, the cool new entrance stuff where you're kind of a bunch of people are starting out of balance, the changes are not that significant. So, you know, compared to the last wish and garden where there's some new changes and stuff like that, you know, not super significant. There's some exploration happening in those raids, but this raid could certainly be taken down to a mid nine this year, certainly. Um, so I'm pretty excited for that. Now, arguably, if you've watched the past two speedrun breakdowns, this one is maybe not as exciting. I mean, it has some more boring encounters after first encounter. All three of the remaining encounters are done similar to how they are in LFG, right? Nothing too mind blowing like 3-3, but um, still a fun watch nonetheless. And, um, you know, if you guys uh, have the pleasure of watching this run on your own time, I'm not going to destroy your ears right now, but their pop off reaction is pretty nice as well. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for Tanix. Um, pretty much it for Deep Stone Crypt as a whole. Uh, pretty cool raid, pretty short raid, and uh, I know this is a lot of, uh, you know, this raid has a lot of fans, a lot of people love this raid, so I hope I've done the speedrun breakdown justice. Uh, next up, we're going to have Vaults of Glass, which is one of the most boring speedrun raids. However, um, you know, I'll still talk about it, talk about some of the strats that are used, and um, hopefully you guys will enjoy that too. So I'll see you guys later, and um, thanks for watching.